Okay, hello, I'm Ken Rose from UC Santa Barbara. And this talk is about uh, uh, ways that optimal linear estimators can help with um, motion compensated prediction. Uh, so the main uh, contributors are my two ex students, uh, Bohan and Waiting. Bohan is here, he's gonna come to my rescue if you ask really tough questions. Uh, we have uh, collaborations and interactions with a number of Google researchers, including Jingning, Yahoo, Adebarga, Yue, and Angie. So um, here is what we're looking at. Uh, basically, uh, conventional motion compensated prediction, it's block-based, uh, it only accounts for translational motion. And if, and the motivation, the initial motivation to go where we're going is to see that nearby motion vector. Look, for example, let me see if this works. This seems to work, yeah. <coughs> I don't know, do you see the cursor? Yes. Because apparently a pointer would not work here because I would be pointing at one of them and not the other. Uh, so anyways, uh, if you look at motion uh, vectors, so each block has a motion. Let's look at the left block and it's, this is its motion vector, but the nearby block has another motion vector pointing in a different direction. And obviously this other motion vector might have some useful information. For example, pixels that are closer to that block might be benefiting if we consider that motion vector. So uh, that's kind of at a very high level. So uh, we're gonna see contributions based on somehow related to this observation um, uh, to forward prediction and bi-directional prediction. Uh, let's see if I need this again. So basically, uh, I, I skipped to, obviously, yeah. So it doesn't work as well as I thought. Uh, so what you can think about is at every given pixel, look at the blue pixel, for example, they're gonna be a, uh, in some neighborhood of it, there'll be a bunch of motion vectors that might be useful when we try to do the prediction for that pixel. So for the, I guess, orange pixel, there is another, we drew some kind of a circle with candidate uh, motion vectors. And for the blue, similarly. And you see that this uh, kind of thinking uh, is not impacted by the fact that you might have variable size blocks and everything because we just consider the motion vectors and locating them at the center of their respective blocks. No, this is doing twice. Okay, I'll have to switch techniques. Um, so uh, basically, if you take all these candidate motion vectors and uh, position them at the pixel of interest, they'll be pointing at some pixels on the reference frame and we consider those as noisy observations of the value of the pixel that we're interested in. Um, so if I say noisy observations, that leads very naturally to the notion of why don't we use what's called the optimal linear estimator? Uh, because basically we're estimating something, some random variable from a bunch of noisy observations. So this is a classical thing. So here is like uh, estimation 101. So if you have a bunch of observations, I put them in a vector X and the linear estimator would be basically some W transpose X and the optimal weights will have to satisfy the uh, famous, uh, I guess, normal equation, which um, uh, where you see W right there in the middle and uh, you multiply it from the left by the autocorrelation matrix containing the correlation between the observations and on the other, the other guy is the cross correlation vector between the observations and the guy we want to uh, to estimate. So this is a, so at this point, obviously, we could actually apply the optimal linear estimator if we knew what the autocorrelation matrix was and if we knew what the cross correlation vector is. So let's look at the autocorrelation matrix and how we would estimate it. Basically, as we said, each element of the matrix is basically uh, the correlation between two pixels in the reference frame. And if you look at them, and uh, you'd see that they are pointing two by two motion vectors. And 
Uh, if we model uh, pixels uh, in a frame as uh, satisfying a first order Markov process statistics with some spatial correlation coefficient rho sub s, then the cross correlation between any two of them would be uh, something like uh, rho to the power the distance between them, which would be basically the norm of the difference between the motion vectors. So that makes it uh, pretty simple. And we, of course, can estimate those rows from just a whole bunch of statistics. Um, cross correlation is a little bit more involved. Uh, basically, the problem is that we're dealing with correlation between a pixel in one frame and a pixel in another frame. So we can't just plug in this row S and, and have an answer. So uh, the trick here is to think of what would the true motion uh, point to in the reference frame. We don't know what the true motion is, but let's call this guy S. It's right there. And then we can say that the cross correlation between X, I, and Y would be under the assumption of separable spatial temporal uh, Markov process would be basically the product and you'd have the temporal correlation rho t times the spatial correlation to the power the distance between s and xi. So all this is nice but of course we have no idea what s is and therefore what the distance is. Uh, so here we try to get a handle on it. Um, so we need some kind of a subterfuge to calculate a cross correlation. So we know that xi is derived from motion vector, the ith motion vector. And we also uh, assume that this cross correlation decays with distance between y, the pixel we're trying to estimate and where the motion vector is located. So look at the left here, if this is a block and so we assume that the motion vector was at the center of the block. So if y, the pixel that we want to estimate is here, we assume that the kind of uh, the correlation would be decaying with, or the value of the motion vector will be decaying with distance. And another important observation is that what happens when you look at a pixel outside the block for which a motion vector was estimated? And we expect things to go a little worse because you cross the boundary, the guys inside the block were actually used to estimate the motion vector. Somebody outside was not involved even in the process of estimating the motion vector. And indeed, if we just do some, collect some statistics, we see the red above the correlation versus distance from the center for the motion vector. And we see there is a drop exactly when you cross the boundary. Okay, so armed with this, we are, uh, kind of suggesting let's model the decay of the reliability of a motion vector with distance, something that would be exponential in the square distance. And we also add, so you see those two, these are what we call the reliability. And we add a, another beta before it for anybody outside the block. So, that's, uh, so that captures both issues. And now comes a simplistic uh, approach that we say, let's suppose for simplicity that one of the motion vectors in the neighborhood of a pixel is the true motion. And each one will be chosen in probability and the probability is proportional to the reliability. So basically all motion vectors in the vicinity of a point are competing with probabilities proportional to their uh, reliability. So this is P sub I of Y. And so this is a simplified motion, just a uh, notion that is gonna help us get a handle on the cross correlation. So now what we're saying is the expected distance between that point, that elusive point S, the true uh, kind of corresponding point in the reference frame and uh, X I would be uh, basically, the, this, there will be just a bunch of possibilities. One of the MVIs is the winner, we're coming with probability P sub J, and we just weigh the distances between uh, S 
and xi, which is basically the difference in the motion vectors, the corresponding motion vectors. So we have an expected value of the distance between the mapping point that we don't know and xi, and we plug it in, therefore, and we get the cross correlation right there. Now we plug it rho sub s to that expected uh, distance, and uh, we plug it in, we obtain the weights for the uh, uh, estimator. And this is just a simplified example to show you if it was in 1D and basically you have a motion vector at point zero, a motion vector at point eight, and those two motion vectors are used with weights. And here is the difference in terms of the motion vectors. And on the right, you'll see how the weights vary from zero to, um, to eight and how the two curves, one, the blue one is for a big di difference between the motion vectors and a reddish one is for a smaller distance between the two vectors. And you see how the weights W naught, the weight associated with the guy on the left is varying with location. Of course, in real life, there are multiple motion vectors and it's not 1D, but it's just to demonstrate how it works. Uh, another issue that comes uh, immediately is that in reality, neighboring motion vectors coming from different blocks may be pointing to different frames, reference frames. So we need to find a handle on this uh, for the autocorrelation matrix, because now it's not going to be the correlation between two pixels in the same frame. And the idea is to find a common past frame. So here is roughly speaking. So you go through the, what we call the motion vector chain. And if we have, for example, um, P naught and P1, so the P1 has, has maybe going through some other reference frame is actually uh, pointing to some somebody on the same, in this example, it's on a frame that one of them already exists on, but it could be a different frame where you have to map both of them too. And then we calculate what's called a DCM, like the common on the common frame, the distance between them. And still assuming that rho t is approximately one, we can just basically write it as rho s to the power of DCM. So that's the kind of uh, uh, clunky solution we had for this. Uh, so overall, the system is we derive a per pixel optimal linear estimator. It's different, different for different pixels based on the estimated cross correlation vector and autocorrelation matrix. Uh, we employ the estimators to form a current frame prediction and the prediction coefficients, remember, account for both the distance between and the difference in nearby motion vectors. And it automatically adapts to local variations. And here are some results uh, and this is where we're at right now um, with assuming single reference frame per block. That is, we are disabling the compound mode uh, for which we have not yet the full solution. And, uh, and what we see is this performance improvement. Uh, it's on the average about 8% uh, BD rate reduction. Uh, on a bunch of sequences, as you can see on the right, is by basically PSNR versus file size, basically PSNR versus rate. Um, for one of the sequences, not one of the more modest gain sequence, I think it's bus. Okay. So this gives pretty big gains, but now we have to go to the, uh, what did they do? Go the wrong way. Uh, and here is the issue with compound mode. This is work in progress should be taken with a big grain of salt. It's actually, uh, we don't have a full solution for this case, uh, but we could do a patch just to see, can we gain something without actually constraining the codec at all? So we have a patch where we just, because the compound prediction is basically a weighted uh, prediction from two frames, we go, and let's assume that there is another vector, let's say V1 here, pointing to yet another place nearby, and we have to now combine them with this linear estimator. So for that, we need distances. So the idea is to calculate these DCMs for each one of the two guys that, form, that are part of the uh, compound, 
uh, thing and then weigh them with those weights. So that's like a clunky patch that we had and run the whole thing. And so those preliminary results show that it's not a total loss. We still have about 2% BD reduction without constraining the codec at all. But keep in mind that we haven't really solved the compound mode. So we're expecting more <coughs> gains overall. Uh, also, we have not even, uh, uh, we have not even train the parameters for the compound mode. We basically use the parameters from whatever we had before. Okay, so now let's switch the little gears and show the other side where things, uh, another perspective where this can come into play. So we're looking generally at bidirectional prediction. Of course, the compound mode is part of this business. But now we're focusing on the observation that there is some redundancy in motion vectors here. So if you're predicting frame N and from these two frames, one kind of in the order in the future, one in the past. Uh, this is an interesting situation. Uh, why do we have uh, redundancy in motion vectors? Because there is free motion information between the two reference frames. So if somebody earlier has encoded, and so the decoder has some motion vectors between them. So, and each one of those motion vectors could be viewed as intersecting the frame that we have in there. So providing us with some motion information for free. So we want to exploit it naturally. So basically the situation is we think of it uh, and you see how it connects to the previous part. So you have a pixel P somewhere and by it, and you look at all the projected motion vectors that intersected the frame, you basically have a bunch of candidate motion vectors around it and you can select some in the, in the vicinity of it and say, these are my candidate motion vectors that I have for free. And so we use those candidate motion vectors. Let's move them now to the point. And what we get are pairs of points on the two reference frame that are basically, again, noisy observations that we can now apply a linear estimator to. Uh, so basically, we, now we kind of fall into the same uh, paths. Okay, we want to construct the optimal linear estimator from noisy observations. Uh, this is completely a deja vu. Uh, well, we have autocorrelation matrix and covariance vector. If we find them, we find the optimal weights. So here we're going to take it, but, but the challenges here are a little different. So here we're going to look first at the cross-correlation vector. Let me see if I can actually get this across. So uh, we want to find uh, a cross correlation that is between some xi0 and xi1 between those guys and y. That would be the cross correlation between the observations and what we want. But uh, let's take a little detour and consider that there is some true motion trajectory. And let's say that it's the one connecting S0 and S1 there going through y. And so we think of this as a Markov chain, S0, Y, S1. And basically there is the temporal uh, correlation coefficient, rho t is what controls what's going on here. And we can say that the correlation between S0 and S1 is basically rho t squared times the sigma squared. Okay. Um, now, uh, we now can involve the spatial correlation to get act to access xi, and we can say, okay, rho i between xi and y is basically rho t times the spatial correlation corresponding, uh, we call it rho si between s and xi. And of course, the correlation between xi naught and xi1 will be rho i squared. Right, because basically there, it's basic since everything we're assuming is nicely Markovian. And here is the trick: the, uh, we can write the correlation between x i and y as the square root of the correlation between x the two points at the two ends, because of this it is principle. And this correlation we can actually we have we can calculate for free from the actual reference frames because what we need to do is collect data around xi1 and the collect pixels 
like a, let's take a block, write xi zero and calculate their correlation. And then we get rho zero one i and and then the square root of it is plugged in and we get the cross correlation. So basically we estimate a cro cross correlation locally from information available at the two reference frames. So that was, so that's actually pretty, turns out to be pretty accurate. And now we have to work actually in this case a little harder for the autocorrelation. Remember that we had an expression for the cross correlation, which is up there. I'm, I'm too lazy to move the cursor all the time. And what we use, so we again write it as an autoregressive process. So xi is rho i y plus zi, that's the assumption. And the autocorrelation, if we open it up, will be things we know, rho i1, rho i2, sigma squared, plus the correlation between the innovation parts that we had in this model, zi1, zi2. So that's the thing we have to estimate. We assume, again, exponential decay. And so we write it as appears there. So it decays with distance, which corresponds basically the difference between the motion vectors. And we get an answer. So basically, we can plug it in and get our autocorrelation. So what happens? So we, we obtain the optimal, well, optimal to the degree to, that our assumptions are right, uh, optimal linear estimator. And we can therefore use it, apply it, to generate a frame, a, uh, an estimated frame co-located with the frame we're trying to predict. And uh, the only kind of fly in the ointment here is that all this was based on the assumption that the motion between the two reference frames were kind of linear as we, inter we intercept the uh, frame we're interested in. And in life, that's not necessarily true. So there may be some offset. So maybe we need to somehow correct in order to get the prediction to work. And the solution is to use this co-located frame as just another reference frame that we obtained for free. And now if you use it as a reference frame, then we can add small motion vector corrections in the usual process. You calculate a motion vector, which in this case will be basically just a small offset motion vector for each uh, block. So basically, that's the way it could operate. And, and we'll overcome the issue that motion is not necessarily that linear all the time. Uh, OK, so and, um, and this idea of co-located frame already appeared in an earlier work where uh, basically but the, the idea was to just use the two reference frame and calculate the optical flow between them and obtain for free this thing in the middle. But, but this approach actually is enormously less complex than that one because we really build on the existing motion vectors and so on. Okay, so here's some experimental result. Uh, okay, there is a little, another little bullet advertising what I just said. Um, and it looks like the, uh, on the average, we get a BD rate a reduction of about 4%. And on the right, you see again on that sequence bus, uh, what's the PSNR versus rate. So this is the kind of result we're getting here. And uh, I am pretty much over my time, so maybe I'll cut it off. That's my last slide. I was going to say only that remember the things that are work in progress. Another thing that is work in progress is now to combine these two approaches that we had which are kind of uh, complementary, because this could be part of the answer for the compound mode that we talked about earlier. Yeah, so I think this is this is um, very encouraging. Um, actually, this is something that we did with the Thor codec. We did interpolated reference frames also, but that was using block-based motion estimation, which, as you say, is is complex. So it's very so. Just to comment that this is very interesting that you can 
leverage the existing motion vectors. Um, I wasn't quite clear whether you are still in this method calculating per pixel autocorrelation matrices, whether you have to do that or, or whether you have kind of a, a built-in parameterized model for, for combining these values. So uh, this also works per pixel. It's, it depends on, so it depends on the motion vectors that are nearby, right? That are yeah. interse in, intersecting the frame nearby. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it is. And also we're using where they're pointing to for that pixel. Uh, there could be, yeah. So basically it is adaptive per pixel on the positive side. Yeah. And the may, if you're asking about the complexity, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, just, just to some extent, because I, if you were to kind of quantize this down to say four by four blocks or something like that, you, you know, keeping your, your calculations somehow block based, is that, is that possible with this approach? Yeah, I, I think you'd be giving up precision for not much. I don't think the actual complexity here is a problem. So uh, you could do, there are ways to kind of sim simplify the computation at some cost. Uh, I don't think it's that uh, major cost yeah, per I'm, pixel. I'm trying to get why. at what the per pixel computation that you're actually doing is. Are, are you doing a matrix inversion for each pixel or? Uh, it, it, yeah, I guess. Because that's not easy. So yeah, that would depend on how many uh, nearby motion vector you're looking at. Yeah. Okay. You see, the, that's the the size of the matrix is basically how yeah, many so points are involved. So they'll be they'll be the same as the number of motion vectors yeah. that you're considering. Yeah, it's not, I, it's I not think like I, a massive I, uh, matrix. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. So yeah, there are ways to to trade off one for the other. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, the results you're showing in that one and you showed before, are those in actual codec or is this like sample code where you just redo motion estimation and measure the difference between this both? This is on AV1. This is on AV1? Yeah. Okay, then um, second question is, uh, a lot of this is based on optical flow, and um, how do you see the rate constraint um, changing the flow, and how does that impact uh, your results? I'm not sure I get the question. Well, I mean, so so basically, you're assuming this correlation between motion vectors under like optical flow that you're going to have this coherence, and that you can your pixels are going to make sense. But what we often see when the rate constraint becomes higher is that it'll just pick whatever costs less, and then your optical right. flow is distorted. And my question is, do you see an impact on this for your results? Yes. So, uh, OK, so two parts answer. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the, the implicit assumption is that the motion vector that you calculate, for example, let's say let's talk about the last part between the, between the two uh, reference frames is meaningful for the guy in the middle. And it wouldn't if this was were just arbitrarily chosen because of some reduced cost. But the built-in, um, because we are calculating cross correlations, actually, then we may be able to uh, to I'm I'm guessing. Look, I'm I'm answering off the cuff that maybe that may be downplayed by the by the optimal linear estimator when we calculate in cross correlation and auto correlations so that may be given less weight to less useful um, observations so if i understand correctly it would be your auto correlation cross correlation matrices would be kind of qp dependent or like no i'm just trying weighing? to say that, so the job of the of the linear estimator is to somehow weigh things correctly so i'm uh, i'm I'm hoping that right now, because I'm not, I haven't thought about it enough, that somehow that will take care of the fact that some not properly matched uh, information is being plugged in. So that means some of the observations are going to be not as useful as others. So, but with limited warranty, I'm giving this answer. I have to think about it a little more. All right, thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I think we're, we're running a little bit behind, so maybe you can ask the questions of Ken offline. Thank okay. you very much.